Blydenboro is a small community surrounded by pine forests and swamps at the southeastern edge of North Carolina. It's also the setting for the biggest monster hunt North Carolina has ever seen. During the winter of 1953-54, a frightening predator made its mark on the small southern community. It hunted at night and killed several pets and livestock almost daily for two weeks. It not only killed its prey, it completely mangled their bodies and drained them of blood. Coined the Vampire Beast or the Beast of Bladenboro, it terrified the small town. Fasten your seatbelts, folks. December 29, 1953. It all began in Clarkton, North Carolina, approximately eight miles from Bladenboro. Linda, a local who has lived in the area for many years, heard the neighbor's dogs barking and whimpering loudly in fear while she was doing the dishes. She went outside to see what the hell was going on. While looking in the direction of her neighbor's house, out of the corner of her eye, she saw something moving near the tree line. She focused her attention in that area. Shocked, she saw a huge, dark, cat-like creature about five feet long sneak away into the wooded darkness. The dogs continued signaling for about an hour while scratching on her neighbor's door to be let in. They know shit ain't right. December 31st, 1953. Woody, a resident of Bladenboro, heard a commotion outside with his German shepherds. They were barking and snarling wildly at something off in the distance. Fearing it was some kind of predator, he quickly retreated to his bedroom and grabbed his shotgun. While loading it, he heard his dogs suddenly fighting with something on the front porch. Something big. Things were being knocked over. Glass was broken. Loud thumps were occurring repeatedly. It was a massive struggle. Even though he hadn't finished loading his firearm, he scrambled to the front door and jacked the shell in the chamber. Time to rock and roll! He forcefully swung open the door and saw a huge creature running away from the house. He fired two times from the hip. He looked down and saw blood all over the porch. Huge puddles of it, along with a pool of saliva. The hell? One of his dogs lay lifeless in the front yard, drained of blood and missing its lower jaw. The other trembling with a look of utter fear. His dad wrapped his fallen friend in a blanket to be buried the next morning. Shortly after that, he heard the other German shepherd barking wildly. He went out to investigate. When he opened the door, he didn't see anything, including the body of the blanket-wrapped dog. The monster came back and dragged it off into the wilderness never to be seen again. Damn, that fucker's ruthless. Later on, about 1 a.m., he awoke to hear his other dog barking outside. I would have let the other dog in the house, at least for the night. While racing to get his gun, he heard it yelp in pain. Then, everything was silent. He ran outside and 
found that his other buddy was missing. He reported it to the Bladenboro Police Department, who came out with two deputies and they searched the farm. Several hours later, one of the deputies found the second dog dead in a hedgerow. Upon further inspection, the top of the dog's skull was ripped off and its rib cage was crushed. Its body was all wet, like it was in the monster's mouth, and it was completely drained of blood. January 1st, 1954. Fran went outside to feed her pit bulls one morning and noticed they didn't come out to greet her. Feeling that was odd, she called for them. She got no response. Worried something might have happened to them, she went searching for them. After 30 minutes of looking, she found both of them lying lifeless in a field. Their heads were crushed. Their bodies looked like a fur-covered skeleton. Like Paris Hilton? Upon further examination, they were totally drained of blood with several holes in the sides of their necks. January 2nd, 1954. Tim, a farmer in Bladenboro, was awoken by the sound of his dog yelping in pain. He grabbed his gun and rushed outside in the freezing cold in his drawers. Shrinkage! He scanned his property and saw his best friend lying dead in a ditch. When he got a closer look at it, he discovered its head was smashed flat and its body depleted of blood. Man, that sucks. January 3rd, 1954. Willie went outside to play with his dogs in the evening, but couldn't find them. He called a friend to come over to help look for them. The two men scoured the land, looking for the wayward pooches. Willie saw a mass of fur in the tall grass out in the pasture. When he investigated it, he found both of his dogs were dead. Infuriated, he had an autopsy performed on one of them. In the report, it stated that there wasn't more than two or three drops of blood in it and that the victim's bottom lip had been broken open and his jawbone smashed back. Also, it had small puncture marks on its neck. Its cause of death was determined as mass trauma. So, being drained of blood is a form of mass trauma? January 5, 1954 In the evening, Betsy went out to her rabbit cage to feed her bunny she named Cotton. When she got there, she saw her bunny lying on the ground outside its ripped open cage. She rushed over to it. When she saw the state it was in, she screamed. It was cleanly decapitated. Sobbing, she picked up its limp body and it was still warm, but no blood came out of its stump. I guess she could have had possum pfeffer. January 6. 1954. Miss C.E. Kinlaw walked outside one morning to look into why several dogs were whimpering loudly. When she stepped out on the front porch, she saw the beast stalking her from about 20 feet away. Suddenly, it bolted towards her in full attack mode. She screamed and ran inside the house, 
slamming the door behind her. Startled, her husband asked, what's wrong? She told him that a giant cat-like creature charged at her. It was gonna get her, dude. After finding out that she was okay, her husband stormed outside with his shotgun and searched for it, ready to end its reign of terror. It's on now. It had apparently ran off into the swamp. However, not far from his porch, he saw where the beast had left large cat-like footprints in the mud, much bigger than a silver dollar. January 7, 1954. Charles got up early one morning to go bird hunting with his German short-haired pointer. When he got near the kennel, he observed that it was destroyed. He nervously looked around and called for his hunting buddy. He was well trained and always came when called. But this time, he didn't. That ain't good. He frantically searched the area. He found his friend lying dead in the pasture near the Bladenboro Swamp. His body was emaciated and skeletal with two small trickles of blood on the neck. January 9, 1954. Julian, who owned a local gas station, went to feed his livestock down at the barn. When he got there, he observed several of his animals were dead. He reported that a mysterious creature killed three of his hogs, a couple of his cows, and one of his goats. The goat's head was flat and dissipated. Well, that must have got his goat. They all had puncture marks on the sides of their necks and were all completely empty to blood. That same night, folks also heard weird noises that sounded cat-like and some that sounded like a baby crying or a woman screaming. On January 3rd, a local named Malcolm saw the creature in his backyard and described it as four and a half feet long, bushy, and resembled a bear or a panther. Also on January 3rd, a man named Carl reported seeing the creature. He described it as small and said that there was another one just like it running beside it. Oh man, there's more than one? Shit! A third sighting on January 3rd was reported by another local, James. He said, At about 11 o'clock, I heard a strange noise outside my window. Sounded like a baby crying. I went outside to follow the noise for close to a mile. I saw the bushes moving, but I never did actually see whatever it was. However, I, I think it must have been close to 150 pounds, the way it moved through the bushes. That's a big pussy cat. <coughs> On January 4th, Lloyd claimed to have seen the bloodthirsty monster. He reported his encounter with the cryptid to the local newspaper. I got two dogs, a little black one and a brown one that's bigger. Me and my wife were sitting here in the living room. We heard the dogs get awful restless. My front light was on and my neighbor Larry had his back light on. I glanced out the window and saw this, this thing. It had me plumb spellbound. It was about 20 inches high. It had a long tail, about 14 inches. The color of it was dark. It had a face exactly like a cat. Only, I ain't ever seen a cat that big. It was walking around, stealthy, sneaking, moving about, trying to get to my dogs. 
I jumped for my shotgun and loaded it and went out to shoot it, but it, it moved into the darkness right away, and I couldn't find him again. A group of hunters from Wilmington spent that night tracking the creature for three miles around the swampland. According to them, the tracks showed claws at least an inch long which indicated an 80 to 90 pound animal. The beast's circling movement suggested it might have had offspring or a mate nearby. The beast was witnessed attacking a dog. The monster was scared off and not found. Tracks were spotted along a creek bank near one of the attack sites. Interestingly, there were two sets of prints and one set of tracks was smaller. Uh-oh, it's got baby blood suckers. A young boy named Dalton reported seeing what he called a big cat on January 6, which made a noise like a baby crying on his porch before disappearing into the swamp. On January 11, two cars stopped when they saw an animal at least four feet long. Jeff Evers, one of the men in the cars, was quoted as saying the animal had runty looking ears and being brownish and tabby. The sheriff said, The animal really upset the women. They were wringing their hands and like that. On the night of January 3rd, Police Chief Roy Forres went out to hunt for the creature with his dogs. Shortly after getting the dogs on the scent trail, they refused to follow the trail and just started wandering around aimlessly. They didn't like the smell of that cat. I'm trying hard not to be vulgar. He wasn't exactly sure why they declined to follow the trail, so he came back to the station empty-handed. The next day, a half dozen brave youths and their dogs set out to dispatch the unknown creature. While that same evening, the chief and eight to 10 other officers conducted their own hunt. Several professional hunters with dogs from Wilmington also made the trek to Bladenboro to kill the beast that evening. They reportedly tracked it for three miles around the swamp before the dogs lost the scent. The Bladenboro mayor, Bob Fussell, told the newspapers about the creature. The beast got national publicity and hunters from as far as Tennessee came to assist. Newspapers from Arizona to New York had coverage and updates on the search for the bloodthirsty creature. Meanwhile, the town was in chaos. Children were not allowed out at night, and families were told to bring their pets in at dusk. Armies of men stormed the forest with guns, trying to find the shifty, vampire-like creature. You don't mess with a southerner, trust me. On the night of January 5th, more than 500 sportsmen and their dogs hunted through the woods and swamps for the monster. See what I mean? During the hunt, one of the dogs assisting the hunters was dragged into the nearby swamp, screaming for its life. Damn, no fucks given. On January 6th, more than 800 people turned out to hunt for the blood-hungry beast in the swamps. At this point, the town was armed to the teeth. Even small boys carried guns. Hell, I was 10 or 11 when I went on my first hunt. Forrest planned to tie up some dogs to use as bait to lure the creature out. Really? However, 
Forres received a telegram from the Humane Society in Asheville, North Carolina, protesting his plan to stake out dogs as bait for the creature. And his strategy was not put into action. That's a good thing. News of the vampire beast of Bladenboro was going viral, appearing in several more newspapers from California to Massachusetts. The press really ain't helping things here. On January 7, another 800 to 1,000 people gathered to hunt down the creature. Okay, okay, but how many cannons did they bring? <laughs> that day, Mayor Fussell officially called off the hunt unless the creature made another obvious kill or there was a legitimate sighting due to safety concerns. You think? Chief Forrest said, With that many armed people in such a small area, I knew someone would surely be shot accidentally. During the evening of January 8th, four fraternity brothers from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill were the only reported hunters. The fully armed pack of brothers wanted to put the beast's head on their wall, but they returned with nothing. They were probably new pledges being hazed by going out on a snipe hunt. On January 13th, Luther Davis, a local farmer, found an unusually large bobcat struggling in a steel trap in Big Swamp four miles from the city, and he shot it in the head. Mayor Fussell told newspapers that the beast of Bladenboro had been found and killed. He hung the body up on a flagpole in the center of town and posted a sign underneath it stating, this is the beast of Bladenboro, ending the nail-biting search. Ironically similar to Vlad the Impaler. After a week or so, things returned to normal in the small town. The hunters left town and the reports of killings and sightings stopped coming in. Whatever the beast of Bladenboro was, it had vanished back into the swamps where it had first emerged. Then, the skeptics' explanations for the blood-sucking critter started pouring in. The trolls of the day. The most obvious explanation was another dog or coyote was behind the attacks. Others speculated that perhaps a mountain lion was to blame. While any of these choices would be valid under normal circumstances, they are a <laughs> bit ridiculous considering the facts. If the attacker had been a dog, let's say another pit bull, the physical damage to those unlucky animals would have been considerably different. Specifically, pit bulls don't possess the ability to kill an animal by crushing its skull, unless the pit bull uses its jaws, causing considerable damage to the tissue. In the case of the dogs, the first blow to the head is what killed the creatures and there were no signs of mauling and tearing, then it ain't a dog. Moreover, there was no barking or growling. The attack was swift and silent. The dogs died without putting up a fight, even with the pit bulls. It was over with before there was even time for them to sound the alarm. Coyotes, although mostly scavengers, are fearsome predators, and they do attack by going for the throat. However, even a large coyote at 45 pounds would have a hard time dispatching a pit bull over twice its weight. Oh yeah, I'd pick the pit bull in that fight. In any case, coyotes aren't known for being silent killers, 
and the goat attacks would have made enough noise to work the dogs in the area into a frenzy. Well, they were whimpering. The goat owners, like the dog owners, simply found their animals dead with no idea how it happened. The last and seemingly the most sensible choice would be a mountain lion, also known as a cougar, and not the good kind. Unlike dogs, a mountain lion is known to hunt over large territories, and unlike a coyote, it could very well overtake a pit bull, oh, without a doubt. The only problem with the theory is that there haven't been mountain lions in North Carolina for more than a hundred years. They're extinct on the East Coast. Besides, mountain lions also tend to attack the back of their prey's necks, severing the spinal column. There are more obvious flaws with these not-so-plausible predators. First, they are predators, yet none of the corpses showed any sign of feeding other than the single wound to the neck and massive blood loss. Yes, the skulls and rib cages were crushed, but nothing was eaten by the predator, which is extremely unusual for a predatory animal. The second oddity pointing away from a traditional predator is the 50-year gap. Why weren't there any attacks in the intermittent 50 years? Did the beast just disappear? Or does it only go on a killing rampage every 50 years? They took a long vacation. One thing is for sure. Something was killing livestock and pets in the Bladenboro area and drinking their blood. That's not even up for debate. It seems to definitely be in the feline genus. It hasn't appeared for a long time, although there are reports of attacks of a creature similar to that in 2007 in nearby Lexington, Greensboro, and Bolivia. And smaller versions of the beast have been spotted walking beside an adult. So they must be breeding somewhere. Could you imagine the foreplay? If you're in the beautiful state of North Carolina and you're outside at night and you hear a baby cry or a woman's scream come from the dark woods, get inside your house, lock the door, and load your gun. You just never know what's lurking out there in the darkness. Wait to strike.